starting from this week, what we will be discussing, right? So, what is the aim of the session, of the three-week session, right? The mechanical properties of metal. You know, when a metal is exposed to mechanical forces, right? So, what parameters are used to express force magnitude and the degree of deformation? If you have a metal, you apply a force on the metal, right? We have to show the force. We have to represent the force that the force was either stress, normal force, tension, compression, right? In the form of torsion, what types of force we have applied. And then we have to see the degree of deformation. What types of deformation was there? Either there was a breaking, there was a cracking, right? There was a completely plastic deformation was there or the deformation was elastic. After removing the force, the, 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 the object or the metal come back to its position. So these things we will discuss. We will discuss what is the distinction between elastic and plastic deformation. These two are important things, right? So these we will discuss in this, these three weeks. What are the elastic deformation and what are the plastic deformation? How are the following mechanical characteristics? Are properties of metal are measured? Like how we measure the stiffness, how we measure the strength, and what is it? How we measure the ductility, how we measure the hardness, the toughness, the resilience, right? Different properties. We will discuss what are these properties and how we measure. And what parameters are used to quantify these uh, properties. Like what should be in the metal. The metal should be large, small, so that it should be of more strength. Or the atomic bonding should be in such a position that the metal will have more strength. So what parameters we will use to quantify these properties. So all these, all these things uh, we will discuss in these three week session, right? which is the mechanical properties of metal. So the leg, what we have done so far, the hardness, the creep, and this week we will do the tensile is related to this, uh, to, 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 to these topics of the uh, week, right? These three topics. Now we have here an overview of the system. You see here is a photograph, right? They show the apparatus that measure the mechanical properties of metal using the applied tensile forces. Here we have the tensile testing apparatus. Usually we call it universal testing machine. We can do tensile testing on it, we can do compression testing on it, we can do three, three points bending testing on this. So in this machine, we apply force on the material, either in the tensile, uh, the tension or compression or depend on three point bending. So second figure is the graph which gave us uh, the tensile test result, right, of an operator such as this steel specimen. So we have the steel specimen here. So, whatever test we perform, we can represent it in the graph similar to like this one. We will discuss this graph, what is it, but here we are just giving the overview. So, in this manner, right, the mechanical properties like the modulus of elasticity, or we can say the stiffness, the yield strength, the tensile strength, we determine with this way, right? And this graph, usually known as stress strain curve, right? Stress strain curve is very, very important in the material science. We can find a lot of properties of the metal or any other material using this graph, right? So this is very uh, important graph. We will discuss this also in detail uh, in this session, right? In the lab, I have also explained this one and in the theory we will explain in a more detailed way. So you see in the another figure, there is a suspension bridge. So the weight of the bridge is what? There is the weight of the bridge, the metals, the, the, the metallic cables are here, the car passing on the uh, bridge. So all the weights, if you combine, it is exerted or it is applied on the bridge. So then you can see, you see what happens in the bridge, we have these cables, right? And we have the load applied here, below. So the car load, the whole load is here. So these cables are in tension, continuous tension, right? So we have to find the properties, the tensile properties of these cables. So there, is it suitable for this application or not? The metal alloys from which these cables are constructed must meet certain stiffness and strength criteria. So the cable is made from some metal or some metal alloys. So those metal alloys are the metal. They must meet certain criteria to be used here in the bridge. Otherwise, we cannot use the uh, material without knowing the properties. Right? So, stiffness and strength of the alloys may be assessed from the test performed using the tensile testing apparatus. So, we see these types of properties we can assess from the tensile testing uh, experiment. Right? So, all these, like the, this bridge is one of the examples. 
We have a lot of application like this. Wherever we are using a component, you have the car chassis, right? You are using some steels there. You know the weight of the car. You know the weight of the passengers to be sit, uh, will be sitting in the car, right? The engine, the whole body weight. So based on that strength or stiffness, you choose that this material is suitable for the chassis of this car or not. You also keep into the consideration the impact loading. Let's say something happened. So God forbid that the accident happened. There is impact loading. So what will happen to the material? Whether the material is that much enough to absorb the energy coming from the other vehicle or some wall or something. So this thing, we will discuss all these in the, these three weeks, right? Now here, why we study the mechanical properties, right? So you can see, you can read the sentence, it is mandatory on engineers to understand how the various mechanical properties are measured and what these properties represent. Now, this is very, very important. If you are saying that the material is stiff, the material is hard, right? The material is uh, having high strength. The material is having high ultimate tensile strength. Now, physically, or in the common world, what does it mean? This is very important. If you know that the material is hard, it doesn't mean hard material will not break. No, hardness is different than as compared to the stiffness. A ductile material behaves differently as compared to a brittle material. Now, we can have two metal. You will see, let's say, we have the iron and steel. Almost the same, like a common person does not differentiate these two things. So this is iron, this is steel, both for them it is the same thing. But for us as an engineer, no, there is a big difference in iron and steel. Steel is an alloy of iron. So sometimes the cast iron is the most brittle material, while the steel is ductile. Right? So these things, we as an engineer should know it. If we know it, we will be able to design the thing properly. If we don't know the material properties, we cannot design anything. If you are working in, let's say, in a car, you want to make the chassis. So you should know which material you are using. How much is the density? So density will tell how much heavy it will be. Right? So all these things we have to know. They may be called upon the design structure component using predetermined materials such as the unacceptable level of deformation or failure will not occur. So to know the deformation level, to know when the material will fail, for all these, we need to understand the mechanical properties of metal. Right? So, in the process structure properties performance criteria, in that scheme, the reason for studying mechanical properties of metals are as follows. These two lines, right? These two points. So, components made of steel alloy that are exposed to external stresses and forces. Now, stress and force is two different things, right? Although we, we, we say that force versus extension, sometimes we say stress versus strain. Why? I will explain this in the, this, uh, uh, these topics. Also, in the, the, the lab, I have explained. In the tensile layer. So, must be processed so as to have appropriate level of mechanical characteristics. And mechanical characteristics are stiffness, strength, ductility, toughness, all these. We also have to understand that it is essential that the designer or the engineer understand the significance of these properties. Now, just to know the properties will not work. We have to understand what is the significance of this thing. Significance means why it is important in the design uh, process. Why we are taking care that the material should be ductile, not brittle. So if you know the importance that the ductile material can, uh, uh, cannot break easily, it will be deformed, it will, there will be a deformation. And then later on, there will be nicking and then it can break. While the brittle material, even if you apply a small load, it can break very easily. So we should understand the significance of the property. In addition, so we have to develop a sense of perspective as to acceptable magnitude of properties value. Now, ductile means that we, we don't need a plastic material like, like a plastic polymer. Polymer is much more ductile. So we have to understand the acceptable magnitude of the value. The ductility level should be, let's say, this much up to here. Not like if we need too much ductility, let's suppose here. Right? Or if you have a scale, let's say, from 1 to 100. So what is the, the brittle material in 100 is the ductile, most ductile material. Now we have to understand in this range how much ductile we need, right? It doesn't mean that somebody says that we need ductile material, so you go for the most ductile one. Or somebody says I need brittle, no. For different application, we there is certain uh, level of the, the property value. So the magnitude of the property value, we should understand that one. That's why we are studying the mechanical property of metal, right? Now here we can see some example, like many materials, 
when the service are subjected to forces. So usually you say that how the, the, the materials are subjected to forces. In some cases it is very much clear. Right? In some cases the load of the forces you don't see, but it is there. For example, the aluminum alloy from which an aeroplane wing is constructed and the steel in the automobile exit. Now you see here the, the aeroplane wing. This one. There is a load on it, right? First thing is the load of the, let's say, the engine, or maybe there is fuel, or the whole thing here. This load is like we can see it easily, as if there is a load, we have to take it into consideration. But there is, like the air pressure is here. As it is moving with high speed, so the pressure will be on And there is a resistance force. We have to keep that one into the consideration also. Or on the exam here, we have the exam, so there will be a load of the car body, the whole thing. We have to take that into consideration. In such situation, it is necessary to know the characteristics of material and to design the member from which it is made. So such that the resulting deformation will not ex be excessive and fracture will not occur. Now the reason we should know that let's say we are making the car exit from the steel and we know the load on the exit. So we must know let's say that there will be a deformation, maybe the elastic deformation, right? But we should know that level of deformation that the material should not break, the deformation should not be like this much, that the material just break it easily. So that level of the mechanical property, the magnitude of the values, we must keep it in our mind. And the mechanical behavior of the material affects the relationship between its response or deformation to the applied force. Now when you are applying a force on the material, it responds to that force and that is known as the deformation. Or we say the response to the force, right? Or deformation. So the mechanical behavior of the material affects this. And key mechanical design properties are like we study stiffness, strength, hardness, ductility, and toughness. We will study it. So then we have standardized technique, uh, testing technique like what we are uh, doing the tensile testing. So there are standards for the tensile testing. For whatever compression test, for the hardness test, for the creep, for the toughness, for whatever test we are doing. There are standards, right? Standards are often coordinated by professional societies. Like here is an example. We know that there is a society, American society, for testing and material. ASTM, you might have here the name, right? So this society, like we have uh, an organization, ISO, International Standard Organization for Quality. For different things, we, we have standards there. We have ESME. ESME also gives some standards. Right? So, and this is the website. You can go here and you can find a lot of uh, standards for different things, right? Like for what will be the specimen length, what should be the diameter of the specimen, and how much force we should apply so that it will give us the proper result, the proper value of the property. We should use those uh, specimens or we should follow the steps of the standard society which they are telling us to perform or to conduct the test. Right? So a lot of standards are here. We will study when let's suppose whatever property is coming, when that property I will give you a link of the standard, that where the, the, the standards are there. The role of an engineer, just a theoretical thing, you, you can study it. So the role of a structural engineer is to determine the stress strain distribution within the member that are subjected to a well-defined load. Now, if you are working in a project, right? You are, let's say, working to to, to, to make, let's say, a bicycle, right? So in the bicycle, what you will do as an engineer, your work is to find the stress strain, uh, strain distribution, how the stresses will be distributed. Stresses will come from where? The person sitting on the bicycle, Let's say we have the cycle, right? Somehow like this, and we have the person sitting here. So from the, this load, stress will come. Now we have to understand, we have to tell the people who will manufacture actually that stresses will be some stresses, there will be what level of stresses, what level of stresses will be here on this shop, here, all the things. We should understand and we should convey our knowledge of stress distribution to the people who are working on it. And this may be accomplished by experimental testing techniques or by theoretical and mathematical stress analysis. So stress analysis, how we do? We can do the simulation. We can perform the experiment. You might have seen in the simulation uh, that those colorful pictures, you know, if you have not done, you have the contour bar, right? Some colorful picture are here and here they wrote something like the, the, the numbers are here. Now, it can be for anything, not only for stress distribution, but usually if you are doing the analysis either in the solid works, you can do it also, but in the NCs you can do 
So what you do, you take a material, you put a load on it, and you see how it, the stress distribution, right? So usually if it is red, let's suppose here, so red means high stress will be there, and green means let's say low stress will be there. So if you do the simulation part, let's suppose this part, so this part you will see colorful part right here. So maybe here it is more red, so more stress is here, and a little bit blue or green is here. So that is the way to do the stress analysis, right? Or we can perform the experiment to understand the stress distribution. Material and metallurgical engineer, on the other hand, are concerned with the producing and fabricating material to meet service requirement as predicted by the stress analysis. Now, once we do the stress analysis, stress analysis we do it before the manufacturing. In the design stage we do it, right? So let's say you, you build a 3D model, now you import the geometry from SOLIDWORKS to ANSYS, you do this, the analysis here. And you understand that on this material there will be this much stress, right? So then you go and see which material is will be able to withstand with this much stress and then you choose the material. So there is a role of the material engineer in this process, right? How to select the material properly? So let's say one guy has designed our, and he has done the stress analysis, he will tell you that in the bicycle we have, let's say, three components. Each component is, will be exposed to this much stress. And then you decide that which material I have to use for this component. So this is the way how we do it, right? The whole process. And this is this necessarily involves the understanding of the relationship between the microstructure, internal uh, features of material and their mechanical properties. So we know that the microstructure, we have already studied, the microstructure affects the properties, right? The bonding, how, which types of bonding is there? It affects the properties. And if, what types of microstructure is there? Whether it is crystalline, whether it is monocrystalline, polycrystalline, what is the, the size of the grain? Right? The grain size, we will study. So these things affect the properties. So that's why we have studied the bonding, we study the crystalline structure, and now we have come to the mechanical properties. So all these things are interrelated. Right? So you have to study all these, you have to understand all these to become a good engineer. So this was just the overview, what we will do in these three weeks, and from here now we will start the, the, the main uh, thing, right? Do you have any confusion, any question, any comments you want to share? And are you with me, the most important question? Okay, good. Good. So now we are moving forward. We have to understand the concept of stress strain. These two things are important. We will use throughout these three weeks. So we have to understand the stress strain concept. I'm sure you have studied these two topics in different courses, right? But we will just do a quick revision of all these things here. Now what is stress and what is strain? Look here. We have a material, the, the, the dotted material here. You see the dash dash dash. It is a cylindrical bar, you can say, right? And on this material, let's say we apply a force from this side and we apply a force from this side. Now, once we are applying a force on the material, what will happen? The material will deform, right? Now, the material will deform in which direction? In which direction we are applying the load and it can deform in other direction. Now, how it is deforming in other direction? I will look here into the, the specimen, the red one. The red one is after applying the force. Now, once we apply the force, what happens? The material elongates. The previous length or the original length of the material was L0. But after applying the force, the length becomes L. But if, if the length is increased, now from here this more length come. At the same time, its area, the cross-section area has reduced. So there is deformation in the, this direction also. You see previously the area was bigger this one, but now you see the small one. And this material goes here to, in, to, to continue in the length of the material now. So when you are applying a force in this direction, you can extend the material, but at the same time its cross-sectional area will be reduced. Now there is a deformation, right? So if we take this force divided by the unit area is known as stress. This is known as stress. And the unit will be Newton per meter square. This is stress. Now, how much deformation is there? We can find, let's say, in the length, if we are taking, so we have the original length, we have the new length. 
So how much change was there in the length? So change is like from the, the new length we will minus subtract the original length. This is the change. Or we can say the final length minus the initial length. So change in length. If we divide that with the original length, it will give us another property which is known as strain. So these two things are important. Now look here. Why we are finding the stress and strain? If we are applying here the force, so we have the force, and here is the extension, just normal extension. Let's say it is x. If we have the force and x, the extension, why we are going for stress and strain? Once you have, let's say, the data and you want to plot it, so the force versus the extension will be give you this type of graph, same graph, the stress versus strain will give you. But they will change in the way you but the behavior of the graph will be the same. So the question is why we are coming from here to here and from here to here? This, this is a very important question, right? I will explain this in the video also, but let me tell If I have a specimen, let's say this is much specimen, right? This is the diameter. And if I apply a force in this direction, so I will have the force versus extension graph. And if I have another specimen, a little bit bigger, then I apply a force. So with the same force, can I extend this, this material like x? Um, of course, the x will be less there. We cannot. So, the force and extension is size dependent. If we apply more force here, let's say we are applying 10 Newton force here. So, 10 Newton force can deform this one easily but 10 Newton force cannot deform this material easily. Right? So force and extension are size dependent while now if it is size dependent so we cannot compare the material with each other. How we can compare the material? We need some property which is size independent. So we have to normalize the force and extension. We have to normalize, right? So that we can get the stress for the same dimension here also and here also. Now what we do in that is we take the force and we divide it by the cross-section area on which the force is exerted, the unit cross-section area. So this is this gives us the stress. Now look here, if the material cross-section is this much, right? This is the cross-section area, and another material cross-section is this much. So even if you apply the same force, as the cross-section area is different, so you can say that the deformation then we can find from the stress will be same. So here maybe it will more, here it will be less, but it will be normalized. Like generally you can say that on a unit area, if you increase the area here, so the stress will be less. If you reduce the area, so the stress will be more. It is fine. Right? So that's why we normalize it. Same for the, the strain. The strain what we do, if you are taking just the, 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 the extension. So with one force, the extension will be different and with another it will be different. Or ah, let's say the, 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 sorry, the, the one dimension, this is the dimension of the material. If we have another one, small one, and we apply the force, there will be too much extension. So we need to normalize it. And how we normalize We We take the change, how much change is occurred in the material, and we divide by the original length. So if the original length is more or less, so that point we are taking into the calculation. So it gave us a normalized uh, parameter, and that normalized thing is known as strength. Right? So that's why we are going from force versus extension to stress versus strain. Clear? Any confusion? Now the same way, here we are applying the force away from the material. I studied, I, I, I told you these things in the mechanics too, right? Here if the force is applied in this direction, right? Like we compress the material, so that is known as the compression. So here in this case you can see the original length is this much, right? But the reduced the length, the, 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 the red one, right? So when, once we are reducing the length, so the cross-sectional area is increasing, right? So this is another type of deformation, which is known as the compression. We have the, the shear, the shear deformation. If we have a specimen like, let's say what we have this one, and I apply the force in this direction. So we shear it a little bit, right? So there is deformation. How is that deformation? Let's say the base is fixed, right? So if the base is fixed, this one, and you apply a force in this direction. So this material from here, it will deform to here, right? You see, or you can say 
from here it is deforming here so this here is extension which is represented by theta right so this is another type of deformation known as shear deformation and the, the stress we measure here is known as shear stress and the strain we measure is known as shear strain same uh, things also applied here right the force and extension the shear and the distress and strain but it is like in the other direction now here you can see another one we have a shock this shock so how we are defined we are applying a force right it's which is to your top this is twisting the shock let's say i have this shock and i am twisting like this so if you twist like this and you look at the cross section area here this area so in this area what will happen you see previously this point was here and then i apply a torque in this direction so i twisted it so if i twisted it it is fixed from here right so what happens this point after some time it comes here so due to the applied torque there is a deformation like this material or you can say this particle or this atom now moves to this position so there is deformation also in the torsion so this is the concept of stress and strain so the stress will be either the tensile stress the compressive stress the shear stress and then the torsion right any confusion in this now if we are if we we came to know the stress strain concept now if we want we want to perform a test let's say the tensile test now in the tensile test what will happen and how we do it you will learn it in detail in the lab uh, video but let me just introduce here i have a detailed made a detailed video of around 40 minutes with the experiment and theory but here i will just quickly introduce this thing right so this is one of the most common mechanical stress strain test which is performed in tension right so we 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 apply the the force on the specimen in tension and we pull the specimen from both the end right as will be seen the tension test can be used to 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 a certain several mechanical properties of material that are important in the design and the specimen is deformed usually to fracture this is destructive testing so once we apply the force on the specimen we deform it deform it deform it until it breaks until fracture occur right with a gradually increasing tensile load that is applied uniaxially along the long axis of the specimen the long axis of the specimen you can see the specimen here this is known as dog bone specimen right so we have two shoulder here this one and then we have a uniform cross section area in the middle right and another shoulder here this one so the long axis is this one so we have to apply force in this direction right we cannot apply force here and here no along the long axis we have to apply the force right and this is the, the tensile specimen here the length from here to here this length is known as gauge length right here this is shoulder and the area cross section area of this we take it for the stress calculation this is the cross section area now different types of specimens are used this is a round cross section we we can have a specimen of the square cross section right a rectangular cross section also and round cross section we can also have depending on different standard and this is usually the specimen as it looks like the dog bone so it is known as dog bone specimen for the tensile test we are using right so circular cross section we can use and rectangular we can also use so the standard specimen is approximately 12.8 mm like 0.5 inch whereas the reduced section length should be least at least four times the, the this diameter but this is according to one of the standard and which is the ASTM right that this book is following so it depends like different standards the they have different specimen so the specimen which i showed you in the creep test is also a tensile specimen right so that specimen was the length was very less and that specimen you see it was of this this shape right and the, the cross section area here was rectangular so that was also a tensile specimen but we will study this later on but based on different standard the the dimension changes we cannot say that these are the fixed dimension right if you study the length which i provide you before here where here this length so the asdm standard dimension you will be there right and you can find even the iso and different but we will study here i have shown in the video also that there is uh, the core iso code and asdm code too i have shown there there is a number of that iso they are the asdm we use e a m something i forgot it but it is like this right and for iso there is a big number i i don't remember but it is there now look here what happened how we conduct the test so the test we conduct 
with a machine which is known as universal testing machine, UTM. You might have heard the name of UTM. This machine looks like this one, right? Depending on the manufacturer, but usually it is like this. We have the, let's say, the jaw here, the jaw here. We fix the specimen. We have the little screw here. And depending on the company, some people apply the hydraulic, or the port with the hydraulic system. Some people with the lead screw, like this one. And some people directly just pull it with the motor or something. It depends from company to company. But the main aim is to fix a specimen, the, the dark bone specimen, this is the dark bone specimen, right? And apply a load along its long axis. And we pull it, right? Now, the load cell is used, here is the load cell, which will use to record the load applied to the specimen. Or the force applied on the specimen, right? It will be given by the load cell. Now, we need the load or the force and we need the extension. For the extension, what we do, we use an extensometer here. The extensometer, what does it do? It, we we fit, fit this, the extensometer on the specimen, right? And it has two, uh, you can say two, two, two legs. One is this one, another one is this one. So if you fix it here properly, and then you are deforming or you are pulling the specimen, so there will be elongation in the specimen, and that elongation will be recorded by the extensometer. The extensometer is usually very, very sensitive device, right? Even the micrometer uh, deformation will be detected if you use uh, the extensometer, the proper extensometer. Now, I'm not sure if some, most of you, you have done the mechanics tool lab. Here in this lab, in the material lab in building 19, what we have, we have the one, the, the small tensile testing machine. In that tensile testing machine, we don't have this dedicated extensometer, proper extensometer. We are using a one-year caliper. We, we, we fix it somehow here or here. So if that is going up, the, the one-year caliper gives us the extension. Okay, that is a one way of taking the extension, but not the right way. Because what happens actually, usually when students do the experiment, they say, we have the data, but the value, like the young modulus or some other properties, the value coming is wrong. Why it is so? Look, the load is okay. The load you are applying, you will have the right way. But if you are taking extension somewhere here from the machine, so maybe the machine parts are so young again. You know, if you are using, this is made up of steel, and you are using the steel specimen, and you are taking, recording the extension from here. So the specimen is elongating, this thing is also elongating. So the extension data you are taking with some other thing is not the accurate data. So what we do, we put the specimen on the side here. The side means on the specimen. We put the extensometer to give us the the, 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 the extent deformation within the specimen. Right? So this extensometer will not give you any other deformation. The deformation only occur in the specimen. And if you use this data with the force, you must get the right property. Right? This is the way. And how? Like this thing. And this thing is then connected to a proper data acquisition system, right? And then it is connected to computer. And this is the specimen which I showed you. We use it, this type of specimen. This thing you will understand in the, the, the lab video properly. I have explained here. But just an overview how we conduct it inside uh, this. Now here, again, the stress and strain. We have the engineering stress and we have the, the true stress. What is true stress? Another is engineering stress. True strain and engineering strain. These words are used. Now, whatever value we are using for the stress in almost all the calculations which we engineers do, we are taking engineering stress. Right? But the true stress is different than the engineering stress. How? This is the question. First, you understand, we have the specimen, like as I told you before, this is the force we are applying to this cross section. Right? So, the force or this here. Yeah. So the force per unit area is the cross section and Newton meter square is the unit. Now look here. We are using the original area here in the engineering stress. Like in the start, what was the area? Okay, that area. And then we are not measuring the area again. But in reality, what happens? You have to understand. If you are performing this experiment, let's say for one minute. So it is 10 seconds here, 20 seconds here, 30 40, 50, and 60. If you are performing the experiment for six, one minute, and you are taking the data of 
force, let's say, and area, right? So here at t is equal to 10 second, or you can say at 0 second, you will have the, the force value and you will have the area value. So one value, so you will get one stress value, okay? But now after 10 seconds, you are still applying the force, the force value you know, right? From any load cell or whatever, force is okay. But look, what is happening to the area after 10 seconds? After 10 seconds, the area is not the same as it was before. Because now you have extended a little bit. So area will be the new area, A, let's say A1. After 20 seconds, the force you can measure, but the area is now reduced more. That is, let's say, A2. And so on. At 60 seconds, the area is very, very small as compared to the original area. But in the experiment, we are not doing this. Like, before we apply the force, then we go and measure the area, and then we put find the stress. Again, we do. No, we are not doing that. What we do, we take only the original area in the start, and we use it in the calculation. That's why the stress calculated in this way is known as the engineering stress. And the corresponding strain will be engineering strain. While the true stress is we have to measure the instant area, the area at 10 seconds, area at 20 seconds, 30, 40, 60, and we use those values, right? Like whatever values are here and we put we find stresses here. And then we plot is known as this the true stress strain. Graph. But usually we do are not using the true stress strain graph. The corresponding strain will be the true strain. Why do we have these both? We have these both. Look, previously, the, let's say the people are doing the experiment. If I go in the experiment and I have this stress strain curve here. Now, up till here, it is okay. But up till about, beyond this point, the nicking started. Now the question is, we are applying the force, but this thing is not going up. It is going down. Why? Because we are not taking into consideration the area. Previously, we have applied a force up to this point to some area. And after that point, when the nicking start, nicking means, if we have the specimen like this, and after some point, if we apply the force, so the material will break somewhere. So this, here we have the nicking. Right? Remove the blue one. Now, and keep looking to the, the, the red one. So here the area is very less as compared to the previous one. Now what happened? Here we have already applied a stress value, which we have applied for the original area. But if you see the area is reduced, so that amount of stress is much more for this area. So even we are not increasing the stress, but there is deformation with the same stress. So this is what we do like this, but actually it is not the case, right? Actually if you do the experiment and you are taking the small area, your graph will go here. So the true stress will go like this, but we are not doing the true stress, all the calculation we are using, the engineering stress, right? So the engineering stress is not accurate. Yes. Yes, it is the case. But that engineering stress is more than enough for us to calculate the properties of the material, right? So that's why we do it. So this is the stress and what is it? Yeah, here we have, the, this is the concise stress, right? If we are applying the force here. So the difference is a little. Yeah, the, the, the difference is also a little different. And the other thing is, this is not possible for all these to go and after every second measure the area. Right? If you put some device, like let's suppose on the specimen, on the specimen like this, to measure the area somehow, they will deform. You know, and it will break with the specimen because this is a destructive testing. So it is very difficult to measure the instantaneous area. Right? So, and then we have the shear stress. The shear stress is actually, we are applying the force in other direction, right? Like one force is in this direction, the other one is this direction, so we shear the area. And the cross-section area which is shear is, let's say, if it is enlarged, so the shear force Divide by the, the cross-section area will give us the shear stress. And the deformation or the elongation here will be in, uh, will be shear strain. Right? So this is the tensile and this is the shear stress. Now, the common state of stress, look here. If we have a cable, we have this mechanism, 
Now we have the stress will be right in the in the real world. If you look into this figure, so we have two types of stresses here. If you see into this cable, the cable on the pulley, right? This cable is continuously at an tension because there are forces acting on it in this direction and in this direction, right? So we have the the, the, the tension in the cable. And the stress here will be tensile stress, and we can represent here with this equation. Or uh, we can say that there are stress we are pulling from here and here, the cable. While on the other side, if you see the shock, this shock, in this shock, what happens? The whole the pulley it rotates, right? So the shock rotates like this. So the shock, what happens to the shock? It is twisting, right? It is twisting. So there is a torsion, which is a form of shear stress. Right, like this torsion is a special case of shear stress, right? And and the, which is known like the drive shaft, which is known as the drive shaft. So what happens here? We apply the force, and it is twisting. So this is a stress, and this stress is shear stress. But this twisting form of shear stress is known as torsion. And we can represent here with with this with the with the tau and the shear force. What's what's it? Do divide by the cross section here. Right, so the the shear now previously we saw in the in the shear space it was the force we apply here so the deformation was only in one angle one side right it was going here let's say if you are looking at in, in two D right so and this is the angle here you see this is the theta but in the in the torsion what happened if you look into the shaft in two D let's say the, the shaft is square let's say just in an, an example. So this is also there is a shear stress in this direction, in this direction, also in this direction, also in this direction. Because the shock is twisting, right? We are twisting it. So this is a special case of the shear. So this is the the common state. Now we have another state of tension, like simple uh, sorry compression. So compression. We have the compression occur. So simple compression states is if we have say this rock, this rock here. So and on the top of it there is another rock. So this rock is what? This rock is in continuous compression, right? This rock is in continuous compression. Or if you have this type of bridge, and you have this uh, what you call the column or the vertical beam, you can say. So these column from here the load will come, and from here this one is fixed. So these column, the red one, they are in continuous compression, right? So compressive structure members are these. These are the compressive structure. And you have studied it in the your uh, mechanics too. There is compressive structure. Some members are compressive. Some members are in tension. In tension. So here, this is the calm state, or you can say the state of continuous compression. While in the previous case, there was a tension, continuous tension. We we also have the biaxial tension. Look here. If you have this uh, tank, the pressurized tank. So from all, all the side, the gas molecules are applying the tension on the material, right? So this the container or the cylinder it is in tension, in continuous tension, right? So this pressurized tank is also the example. The example are other common states of the, the tension. We have the hydrostatic compression. Here we have the compression. In this compression, like a fish under the water. Now, if a fish under the water, what happens? From every side, there is a force on it, a force of water, right? From all the sides, you see here. So that is known as the hydrostatic compression. And later on, we will study if we find the modulus here in the hydrostatic compression, we call it bulk modulus. While only for the tension, if we find, we call it Young modulus. And if we do it for the torsion, we call it shear modulus. Ah, the 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 in the shear. If we do right, so there is young modulus, there is bulk modulus, and there is shear modulus. Shear modulus and young modulus, you might have studied it before in the mechanics too, also. But the bulk modulus is when the forces are from all sides, right? Like in this example, example of the fish. So in the bulk modulus, what will happen? The deformation will not be along the length. Now you just think a little bit. If here you are applying from here, from here, from here, from here. So if you want to find the strain, how do you find the strain? It will not be strain, right? It is like the the change in volume divided by original volume, right? So the deformation will be in the volume, while in the tension and compression we say the change in length divided by original length, original length, L, L not our one. 
right so these are the cases different we will study some in some topic this one so this is known as bulk model so these are the common states of stress right the tensile stress the compressive stress the shear stress right and the torsion now we have the strain which somehow i discussed but look into this slide so we have from the tensile stress the tensile strain will come from here the shear strain will come right so look here we have the, the specimen the black one is the original specimen then we apply a force right so there is a change in length here and in the lateral direction there is a reduction in the length here also right so we 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 pull the specimen so it elongates in one direction and it reduces in the other direction so there is like the, the, we have the, the tensile strain but the lateral strain we also have lateral strain means the change in the length in this direction you see this one where is it yeah here here you see the delta l it is shown delta l by 2 or uh, let's say the the, the the change divided by 2 why divided by 2 because half is in this side and half is here and for this one half is here and half is here right so that's why it is divided by 2 but this is change so this change which is here and here divided by the total width you can say or it is again the length you can consider it as a length so this will give you the lateral strain we put the negative sign because it is reduced right the the the, the things reduced here the, the length the length has reduced while this one it elongates it is increasing so we don't put negative sign here you understand this thing right is it clear that the lateral strain and the tensile strain any confusion in this one guys are you with me so the negative sign the negative sign look if we have a specimen here the there are root too much variable but if you have a specimen let's say this specimen right and i apply a force in this direction and in this direction now after some time what will happen the specimen will become like this you see so we are applying the force in this direction so here we have a change in length which is let's say change just by then right divided by the original length the original length was this much which is till till now so in this direction you see in this direction if we take the strain is known as tensile strain and it is represented by change in length divided by original length all right now if you look into the same figure what is happening in the same figure we have another thing previously in this direction in this direction you see this one this was the length and if we call it the original length w not and the change is how much this is the change you see this one now this change is how is it going up or going less it is reduced right so previously it was w not now this is less so and we call this this uh, change is delta n so as it is in the opposite direction it is not increasing it is decreasing so we put the negative sign here and this is known as the lateral strain clear and we have the shear strain in the shear strain what happened we apply the force here and the black one is the original shape of the material and this angle was 90 degree before but after some time once we apply the force this the, the material come here the specimen and we saw this delta x but this delta x is not linear we cannot say that measure in like millimeter uh, meter it is angular right because it is deformed at some angle and that angle is known as theta right and theta you can calculate by delta x divided by delta y how you know if you take this theta i know you are good at math so you have this perpendicular make this right angle triangle you have the perpendicular here and you have the base here so you can find the angle here and then you can use so this is shear strain any confusion in the size strain lateral strain and shear strain and usually we when we are not taking into consideration the lateral tensile and all these so we can and you might have seen this one always we can say that the strain is equal to the change in length divided by original length so don't be confused with the notation right here it is just change in length and all these you can use any one this one or uh, you can use the delta x or whatever you want to use right so don't be confused with the notation now in the compression case this i already explained the theory you have to study this one but it is the same case right if we have a specimen we apply the force 
right? A and B have the cross sectional area A and R. So in the compression test, what we do? We apply a force in the in the in the, in the to, to compress the material, right? Not elongate the material, we compress the material. And in that case, what happens? The length will be reduced and the area will increase. Right? Just from common sense, you can understand this, right? If you are pressing the material like this, so you are increasing the area and the length will be reduced. While if you are pulling, it is the reverse. Right? So in that case, we do this. Now, why we do the compressive uh, compression test? This is very if we have the tensile test, why we use the compression test? Can you give me an answer, guys? What is the use of the compression test? Because both are the same thing. If you are pulling in this direction or in this direction. If we can find the thing from the tensile test, why we need the compression test? Guys? So why this unnecessarily we are somehow beating or what we can say we are harming the specimen? We are if it can be done from the tension. Some material can only handle compression and not tension. Yes, very good. Hussein. Yeah, this is the, the, the right point, right? And when the test, some material cannot handle the, 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 the tensile test, right? And it can break very easily in tension. So we need to do the same weight test. Like we have to increase or decrease in length and change in the area. We need still the stress and strain. But we cannot pull it, so we compress it. Right? So that's why we do the compression test. The shear and torsional test, same way. Like these are not the shear and torsional stress, but the way how we perform the test. The torsional test, you, you have done the experiment. Most of you, you, you come to the mechanics tool lab, right? And you have seen this the, the machine, the torsional apparatus, right? And then what we do, we are applying a torque on the specimen, and there is a change, right? Which is the torsional change, the, 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 the angular change, right? And we take the theta. So that theta is the strain, here you see, and you have the torque. And from this, you find the torsional stress and strain. And then we plot, again, we plot the torsional stress and strain also, right? We plot the torsional stress and strain and it should be, give us the same graph. And from the tensile also we get the same graph. For the compression also we get the same graph. So if a material, okay, this point I will come later, like this, elasticity and plasticity we will come. 